Hello there friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. Recently, one of our viewers, Gavin, awesome Star Wars name by the way, sent us a letter basically questioning the survivability of the TIE Fighter with a specific focus on the design of the cockpit. He brings up some pretty good points about the TIE Fighter design and I thought it'd be worth a deeper look in today's video. Heck, who knows, maybe we can prove that the TIE Fighter is a lot better and more survivable than what most people think. You know, creating defensive technology is incredibly difficult. It's mostly a reactive field. You take a look at the various kind of threats your forces will face and you try your best to design something that works against all of those threats. Now, oftentimes what happens is one faction will find a good solution to the problem of defense and everyone else will just copycat that design. Take a look at the Joint Strike Fighter Program, otherwise known as the F-35 platform. Then take a look at the Shenyang J-31 or the Turkish Aerospace TFX or the Sukhoi Su-75. Now, I could easily just brag about how the nations that, you know, developed the JSF program are far more advanced, have more open and freer societies and economies, which leads to better utilization of human capital. But, you know, let's not punch down, guys. I doubt they'll even see us coming. What's up, as fuck, boy? No, but seriously, guys, the fact that so many of these other companies have copied the JSF's design simply means that this might just be the optimal shape for a jet fighter that is trying to decrease its radar signature. I mean, for instance, take a look at the B-2 Spirit Bomber, and then you have the F-117 Nighthawk, and then you have the B-21 Raider, which hasn't even been built yet, or China's proposed H-20. They all look pretty similar. So what's with all the stealth designs? Well, it's because the number one danger that jet fighters face in the modern world, aside from poor maintenance, is being detected by the enemy and then getting shot down by some kind of guided munition. You know, everyone more or less faces the same problems when it comes to jet fighter design. And so it's very likely that these other companies uh, came up with the same solution as the F-35, but through their own R&D. Except for maybe like the J-31 and the H-20. They're not even trying. You know, most fifth generation stealth fighters will have similarities. They are usually covered with radar absorbing materials. They'll most likely have an internal weapons bay to further decrease the profile of the fighter, which is why they all kind of look the same. I mean, you see this in a lot of different industries nowadays. Is there really a difference between a Porsche crossover and a Mazda crossover or any crossover? The answer is no, they all look like shit. I'm actually in the market for one. When it comes to starfighter designs during the Galactic Civil War, we see a similar optimization when it comes to designs. While there's definitely a wide variety of shapes for starfighters because aerodynamics and radar profiles are far less important in the Star Wars galaxy, almost all fighters have deflector shields for protection. And that's because the majority of starfighter hulls are lost due to enemy laser fire. I mean, there are proton missiles and concussion missiles and countermeasures, and they seem to work pretty well. But yeah, the, the most common uh, type of weapon is basically an oversized laser. And so almost every starfighter during this period of the Galactic Civil War had deflector shields. Except for the standard TIE Fighter and some of the other variants within the TIE Fighter lot. Now, before we continue, a quick word from our sponsor for today's video, Ownersaber.com. They have a great summer deal for all of you guys. All of their lightsabers are going to be 40% off with free shipping included. That means everything in their Padawan Saber collection, like the Last Brick Lego Blade or the Dunamis, if you're looking for some cross-hilt action. It also means everything in the Master and Replica Saber collection are on sale as well, including the Kyber Core Saber. This has an exposed Kyber crystal slot, so you can tell if you're dealing with a Dark Side or a Light Sider. There's also the Huntsman with its circular blade guard used by the Inquisitors. Or maybe you just want to channel your inner Sailor Moon with the Moonlight Blade. A wise man once told me that behind every masculine man, there is a tiny Japanese anime girl waiting to surface. Check out these lightsabers and many more options at ownersaber.com. We'll link their description down in the description and also comment section for you guys to check out. Also, don't forget to use our promo code EWOK, that's all caps, for an additional $15 off. Thank you for your patience. On to the rest of the video. The reason why Senior Fleet Systems foregoes the shield system can be attributed to the same reason why the TIE Fighter doesn't have a hyperdrive, a full life support system, or heavy weapons. It's basically a cost-saving measure. The TIE Fighter was one of the most widely produced vessels in galactic history, and it was quite an innovative design from a manufacturing standpoint. The twin ion engine is a masterpiece of engineering and efficiency. It features zero moving parts, which greatly reduces maintenance costs. 
It's actually pretty impressive that Senior Fleet Systems, formerly known as Republic Senior Systems, was able to pull this off. You know, prior to the Clone Wars, this was a small boutique uh, starfighter designer. They basically made custom order ships. They had no idea how to do mass manufacturing, and that is incredibly hard to get into. Its chairman, Wraith Senior, however, was a very ambitious individual, and more importantly, had a very close and personal relationship to Darth Sidious. Having built his personal yacht, the Imperialist, and the heavily modified Star Courier used by Darth Maul, which featured advanced cloaking technology. You know, Senior Fleet Systems, despite all of its flaws, was a very innovative company. I would say it's more innovative than even Income Corporation. And so it's not unlike them to approach the uh, problem of starfighter defense in a very unique way here. And so just because the TIE Fighter doesn't have shields doesn't mean that the pilot is completely defenseless. No, far from that. The deflector shield is really just one layer of defense. Every weapon system has multiple layers of defenses, like an ogre or an onion. Oh, you both have layers. Oh. <laughs> you know, not everybody like onions. Cake! Everybody loves cakes! The first layer of defense that a TIE fighter depends on is its scanners. Now, generally speaking, the scanners on a larger Rebel fighter like the T-65B X-Wing is going to be more robust than what's found in a TIE fighter. But remember, the TIE fighter is fundamentally a short-range interceptor. It's built for interception purposes and really just fills in for the Imperial class Star Destroyer's lack of point defense systems. A TIE fighter really shouldn't be judged as an individual fighter like an X-Wing is, and that's because it fits a role in a larger Imperial system. And so when a TIE fighter deploys, they're getting fed accurate and powerful scanner information from an Imperial class Star Destroyer or whatever vessel serves as their home base. And that information, when pieced together, is going to be far more complex and complete than what a Rebel Starfighter is going to see in their scanners. This gives a TIE fighter pilot the initial advantage when they initiate a dogfight against their Rebel counterparts. The second layer of a TIE fighter is actually the squadron. The Imperial Academy system really had one purpose, and that was finding the smartest and most capable individuals in the galaxy and preparing them for Imperial military service. And guess where the most capable and skilled individuals went to? The Imperial Navy, specifically to become either TIE fighter pilots or Imperial bridge officers. While the TIE fighter platform individually might seem like a weak fighter, the skill and experience of your average Imperial pilot far outweighs the Rebel pilot. TIE Fighters were well coordinated and usually pilots flew in pairs or triplets making sure to watch each other's backs in combat. And because usually Empire outnumbered the Rebels, it was very easy for TIE Fighter pilots to keep their enemies unbalanced enough so that they can't actually go on the attack. The third layer of defense is a pilot's skill and the insane maneuverability of the TIE Fighter platform. You can't really kill what you can't touch, right? And since most Starfighter battles happen within line of sight and dogfighting was important, the skill of a pilot far outweighs the capabilities of the starship. It's actually common for rebel pilots to remove their deflector shields from their A-wings to give themselves a bit more speed and power. This shows you just how important deflector shields are to very high-end and well-trained pilots. You know, TIE fighter pilots oftentimes were proud of the fact that they didn't have deflector shields. It was kind of a bit toxic, but it definitely makes sense. Now, the fourth layer of defense is where that deflector shield would normally be. And uh, a TIE fighter actually has other ways of compensating for a lack of shields. And, uh, you know, our viewer Gavin really brings up this great point. You see, the sphere structure is incredibly strong. You know, look across our vibrant and completely not flat universe. Every celestial shape, whether it's a small clump of space trash or some far off super Earth in a distant solar system, to a star is arranged in a sphere shape. When immense gravity sucks in large amounts of particles and mass, it always forms a sphere. Why? Now look at some of the most ancient bridges surviving in the world today, like the Marco Polo Bridge in Beijing or the Caravan Bridge outside of Izmar, Turkey. Both of these bridges use arcs. So why is this? Well, long ago we figured out that spheres and arcs are amongst the strongest structures in nature. And that's because when you apply pressure to these shapes, they, uh, the pressure becomes evenly distributed across the surface of a sphere or an arc. There are no weak points that you can exploit. If anything, it's even more powerful in most situations compared to a triangle. And we all know how much the Sith love their triangles, whether it's holocrons or star destroyers. And so technically speaking, uh, the TIE Fighter hole should be one of the strongest ever created. Now, our viewer Galen in his letter talks about Moff Gideon's crash in the first season of The Mandalorian. He's flying Outland TIE Fighter, which is just a modified version of the standard TIE. It still has no shields. 
Ninjaran is able to damage the fighter by attaching a detonator onto one of the TIE fighter's s struts. You know, detonators usually aren't able to damage the armor on a TIE fighter, but when you place it in one of the weak points, like the struts, it can definitely take the TIE Fighter out of action. And that's exactly what happens. The explosion knocks off an S-Foil and Moff Gideon spins out of control. Lo and behold though, when we get to the crash site, the TIE Fighter cockpit remains completely intact, a sign of the durable sphere design working properly. Galen also brought up the point that there are inertial compensators within the cockpit, which can really aid in protecting the pilot. So the way inertial compensators work is they generate an anti-gravity bubble around the ship and the cockpit. This way, when a pilot accelerates at full speed or does a ridiculous banking turn, they can still stay conscious because they won't feel the effects of gravity on their body. Now, experienced fighter pilots actually like turning down their inertial compensators to like 97 so that they can still feel the airframe kind of moving a little bit. But that is essentially what flying in Star Wars was like. I'm assuming that the inertial compensators within this TIE fighter really help uh, Moff Gideon not die from rapid deceleration. So clearly the sphere shape of a TIE fighter cockpit is unique and well-designed solution to not having a deflector shield on your vessel in the event of a crash. Plus, because of its sphere shape, when TIE Fighter armor is struck, there's a good chance that that blaster bolt might deflect off of it because, again, you're not talking about flat surfaces, you're talking about rounded surfaces, you know, angles, blah, blah. On top of that, the TIE Fighter's hull is covered in quandanadium steel, which was far stronger than regular durasteel found in most Starfighters. It was more than capable of deflecting handheld blasters, but struggled against Starfighter-sized lasers. Sometimes curved armor isn't enough, but there's actually a good correlation in our real world that I'd like to talk about. You see, in World War II and during the post-World War II era, a lot of tank designs like the legendary T-34, the M4 Sherman, even the heavy German Panther tank relied on sloped armor. Tank designers found that sloped armor could stop penetration far better because it forced the incoming round to travel through more material. Sloped armor, like the TIE Fighter armor, also has a chance of deflecting an incoming round away from the crew compartment. It should be noted that a T-34 would never stand a chance against a Tiger at those ranges. It doesn't matter how much you slope your armor, when you're too close or the enemy has too big of a cannon, you're out of luck. But anyway, now sloped armor is a no-brainer. More armor protection and less weight. So then why is it that most modern tanks don't feature a lot of sloped armor? I mean, you'd think that most tanks would look like a Corvette with a turret on it. But instead we get designs like this, the Leopard tank, the Abrams, and then you also have the Challenger. All of these things have very square looking bodies. So one of the negatives with sloped armor is that it actually uh, limits how much you can store inside of the tank. And more importantly, the invention of all sorts of active protection measures now exists, like explosive reaction armor. These are essentially explosive blocks that you put on a tank's surface, and when they detect an incoming warhead or round, they blow out, and they try to neutralize the force coming into the tank. The Israelis have their own trophy system, which actually shoots out an anti-projectile projectile which is like some Star Wars technology, it's pretty crazy. These APS systems remind me a lot of the deflectors we see on the starships in the Star Wars galaxy. And so even though the TIE Fighter has many advantages, especially when it's deployed properly for the mission it was designed to do, having just the sphere cockpit alone for defense feels more like a cost-saving measure than a legitimate solution. If anything, it's the least these Imperial designers could do for their pilots. Let's also not forget that these TIE Fighters have giant transparent steel windows. That is definitely going to be a structural weakness as well. And when something as random and small as a micro-asteroid can penetrate the front viewing screen of your fighter, well, you'll understand just how cheap the Empire is and how little they value the individual fighter pilots. However, I can't help but admire the TIE Fighter's design. In a lot of ways, it kind of reminds me of an Apple product. Completely different and unique from the field. Um, not necessarily better in performance and in a lot of ways, usually worse, but they definitely don't copy that much. And so I come out of this little research mission with a better appreciation of the TIE Fighter's design. I actually remember playing Squadrons a while ago and remarking how tough the TIE Fighters were to take down in the game. Obviously, there are balancing issues that you would see in every game, but you still have to approach attacking a TIE Fighter a bit differently from how you would approach a shielded fighter. Well, thanks for the idea, Gavin. I hope you and everyone else at home enjoyed this video. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. As usual, my name is Alan reminding you that my allegiance is to the Republic, to democracy.